Now let's try it. So we're going to go ahead and get started. 1701 on 8 October, right? Yep. All day? Right. All day. Yeah. All right. So uh, going to go ahead and cover a couple things, one of which came up already. And I'm not sure why, but let's go ahead and so the questions this week, week seven, right? Yeah. So week seven, question number one, know what the text indicates is unprecedented when discussing the grouping acronym BRIC. What impact might this have on innovation? Okay, well, you need to know what that acronym BRIC stands for. Okay, and it's specifically found in your chapter, in your readings. Okay, so once you go in, Find the discussion on BRIC, all right? And then you're gonna find a discussion of something that is unprecedented as it relates to BRIC. And I want you to then take that and answer the question of what is unprecedented might have an impact on innovation, okay? So for you guys that are here, and that might even actually watch the video. Um, where do I find brick? 181. Okay, so what does brick stand for? Uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Right, Brazil, Russia, India, China, talking about emerging markets. Okay, down uh, a couple sentences below that, it says there is something unprecedented. What is it? Accompanying this unprecedented level of company growth, the middle class and emerging market is expanding its position area. Okay, so we didn't quite get there. Unprecedented level of economic growth is unprecedented and emerging markets is expanding exponentially, meaning getting bigger. So if you've got expanding markets and economic growth occurring, does this, how might this have an impact on innovation? Would you expect more innovation if there's more opportunities to sell? Yeah. Would you expect more innovation as people are more rich and have a disposable income? If people have disposable income, might they also now find opportunities in which to invest that money? And now if you've got hotbeds of innovation in certain areas, you might find those now starting to happen in Brazil, Russia, India, or China, right? Good, okay, the other piece then is, um, Anthony, I still uh, don't see you, but at least uh, do I hear you? I guess not, okay. So discussion two, your text states, innovation creates three types of jobs on page 187, right? All right, what are those three types of jobs on 187? If you look down at the bottom paragraph, bottom of the page, about halfway down, you'll see innovation creates three types of jobs. So it's direct, indirect, and induced. And induced, okay, so three types. So define each of the three, yes. and then give an example of where a popular innovation created all three. Don't forget to give me the specific job title of each of the three jobs in the example you give, along with the specific innovation. So I'm asking you, if it says innovation creates direct, indirect, and induced jobs, and you regurgitate the text to me of the three types, that helps. Now I understand you know what the text says. 
Now, give me a specific example. So for example, if the innovation was, for example, the smartphone, right, or iPhone, okay, what would be an example of a direct job that was created because we've invented the iPhone? Yeah, the people that assemble the iPhone, right? That's yeah, iPhone. Job. Okay, yeah, so yeah. the iPhone's popular, it's being sold, direct job, okay. okay. Now, if an indirect job is created around the new innovation to bring the product to market, okay, what would that an example then be of the iPhone? What would be an indirect job? Yeah, the people that are marketing and Good. Good example. Okay. How about uh, now, you know, you never really went to an ATT store to uh, talk to a technician before the iPhone, right? Right. So, you know, you got to have people supporting that. So somebody who can run through and help you sync your phone or whatever. Good. Now, here's where it gets a little tough. Because we have the iPhone and all this stuff available on it, what would be an induced, okay? What might be called a um, trickle down, if you will, type of job? Uh, the people that fix the iPhone glass, so the glass breaks, and they're there, and the third party can come back and fix that. Um, yeah, that, that might be. I think that's starting to get a little more into the direct or indirect because you're specifically working on the innovation. What's, what's a job that's related to something on here? Well, iTunes? Um, yeah, it could be. Do you have apps on this? Yeah, I was gonna say apps. Okay, do you think people that are inventing apps could be considered an induced indirect job, if you will? In other words, what was the demand for apps before the iPhone, yeah. right? Does the, do you have to have an app to uh, have an iPhone? No. no. Okay, so does that help? Right. All right, so I kind of want you to, I want you to work through it. All right, and I'll let, um, I'll let a couple of your classmates know. Anyway, um, so that's what I'm after. All right, Anthony, can you at least see my screen? Oh yeah, yeah, I can see your screen. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and uh, open this up. I, I updated my thing, and now I saw I got this UCAM. It said that I want to update, and I updated it now. <laughs> so I guess, you know, us old folks, we don't need to be updating stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Anthony. Prior proper planning, right? Yeah, we'll figure <laughs> it out. <laughs> all right, hang in there. Okay, so you should see my slides. Yes. All right, so uh, current events. So I love this. Um, first on the right, I think you two will get a kick out of because it's kind of why I found it. All right. Uh, what do you have to do on Sunday this week? Turn in that, um, our, our leadership paper. Yeah, our first paper, right? Yeah, first paper, right. Okay. So on the right is a cartoon. It says, when veterans go to college, the instructor says, your paper's late. You know what happens when you're late. What's a veteran usually say? <laughs> people die. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. No, you lose a letter grade. What's wrong with you? Anyway, that was funny. Yeah. On the left, we had a previous class uh, on a uh, business plan, right? Oh, right. Where you develop out a business plan before you uh, start the project, and that includes pro forma income statements. You're going to work. You got to work through what the projected revenues and expenditures are, right? So that you can demonstrate to people that you're projecting that this innovation is actually going to make money, and this becomes part of the analysis in order to bring the innovation to market to convince people to do this. Well. Jacksonville Daily News this week, a couple days ago, had 
a new innovation, okay, by the city of Jacksonville. What's that new innovation? They're spending, they just bought a closed gas station for almost half a million dollars. Whoa. And they're going to turn it into a visitor center. Really? <laughs> hmm. Because nobody goes on the internet to find information about a city. Hmm. Okay. I, anyway, I'm a little skeptical on this. Um, in fact, I'd like to see uh, the pro forma income statement that shows where over the next five years, the city will recoup half a million dollars on this project. So that's prime, that's some prime location right there. And uh, you know where that Exxon station is. You know uh, where they built all those new, that new boat ramp and parking lot there. By the Shady Center and the Department? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the other side of the river. Yeah, uh, so like if you're coming from the Yop Road Walmart, and you're heading to the safety center, you know, the road bends to the left and there's, it becomes like a triangle, oh. a bridge street, yeah. So that Exxon that was right there uh, is prime location, but the city just paid $460,000 for it. Wow. To turn it into a visitor center. So the article asked, well, what are you gonna put in the visitor center? So, well, we're not sure yet. Well, okay. So, you know, I'm a simple guy. Where is your current visitor center? Well, there's a spot in the Chamber of Commerce building that's off of Gum Branch Road. They have flyers and little doodads. Think of the little rack of flyers you see in a hotel lobby. Okay. Um, so outside of a place to put that, uh, what else would you put in a visitor center that would encourage people to stop in yeah. to recoup half a million dollars? I think it's a uh, higher issue of uh, advertised. Yeah, uh, current events and stuff. Yeah. Advertised Bay Ridge Memorial, advertised the structure they're building downtown. Okay. And get people coming into Jacksonville to let them know about these opportunities they can see that they might miss if they're visiting or something like that. Good. Well, that's good. Again, because nobody uses the internet for that stuff. Yeah. Good point. That's a good point. Well, you may be on it, and I'll be uh, I'll be crediting you in a future class. <laughs> I'm a little skeptical. I'd like to have seen, you know, because, okay, so that's a good idea. But, you know, before I'm going to unleash, because that's, yeah, that's half a million dollars a year tax money. That's capital improvement fund. Right. It's not like we need that 500000 to repair roads, improve uh, crosswalk. Yeah. Uh, that might have been something that was on the, on the ballot that we didn't pay attention to. Uh, well, not necessarily, you know, they, if they decided to pay for it using a bond, then yes, it would have to be on. Right. Uh, but what has happened is we're taking half a million out of existing capital expenditure fund for the city. So the city's on sitting on half a million dollars that they could use to spend on that. That just seemed a little interesting. I, you know, I, I don't know, you know, if we're sitting on half a million dollars, I'm going to look at you because I'm going to then question you on, you know, your occupancy tax that you've got on hotels or whatever. I, I don't know if city's done that, but anyway, just something to think through. Okay. Uh, Unilever. Unilever was a good case study. Um, everybody did a real good job on it. Again, uh, getting into... Um, how you can exist. How long has Unilever been around? Uh, wow. About three centuries, right? Okay, so an established business that is somehow able to 
continually innovate to stay ahead, right? And right. they've been through some rough times and they've been through some good times, right? Right. Okay, so the the key on it is, is chapter nine of your, can I hold up your textbook? The key on that was understanding that uh, chapter nine, which talks about international opportunities uh, for innovation entrepreneurship, it appears Unilever is one of those types, right? Yeah. I think they also capitalize on the depression and mm -hmm. when everybody went internal, they went external and understood the dynamics and capitalized on opportunities that came with the depression and expanded internationally where everybody was trying to buy downsides or upsides. And then after the depression left, they were right there ready to flood the market for whatever they wanted. That's yeah, great. I think that their research and development, I think that was their main key because they stayed out there to see what they felt the pulse and seen what was going on. And I think they really paid attention to what the the environment or the, the community was needing. And therefore they was paying attention also to things that was going to happen in the future possibilities, which led them to be so flexible, I think, and to changing because they changed their how they did business a couple of times they shut a few places down just to concentrate on certain things and I, I think that's what did it so it's one of those things is sometimes you got to do what you do do it well concentrate on that and i think that's that that's what kept them in the game very good so you're uh you guys are spot on in part remember in a depression Okay, if you've overextended, you don't have the resources. Right. Okay, right. now you're in trouble. That's why have a rainy day fund. That's why don't go out and spend half a million dollars if you ain't got it. Okay, save it for, you know, that next storm or that next bad day. So mm -hmm. here's a company that didn't overextend. And you right. find that in some of these longer term companies. For example, uh, Levi Strauss. A company, Levi, maker of jeans, right? Mm -hmm. So they're based out of San Francisco. Levi uh, leaves New York City. Uh, his family has a mercantile business. They set him up with a wagon. He goes west. And he goes out to California because of the gold rush. Gets out there about, not 1849, he wasn't a 49er, but probably within 10 years, 1859, maybe 1860. And they realized that, hey, if people have gold, they need to spend that gold on something. And so he goes out there and he's selling canvas for tents and things to stock and, and live off of. As he gets out there, one of the uh, potential customers says, oh, it's too bad you don't make trousers because we need new, new pants out here. Mm. So they were literally picking up gold nuggets off the ground literally just picking them up and shoving them in their pockets. That's how much gold was out there wow. and how easy it was to find. And if you know about putting rocks in your pockets, that tends to rip your trousers unless they're sturdy. <laughs> so Levi takes some of that canvas they were using for tents. Guess what he makes? Trousers. And he connects with Strauss, who had made some reinforcements to a pair of trousers. He used rivets instead of stitching. So if you ever had a pair of Levi's, you know those rivets on the corners of your pockets? Okay, that's where that comes from. Anyway, so, hey, they're making gangbusters. They're making millions of dollars, uh, literally in those days. Flash forward to San Francisco in 1906, one major cataclysmic event wipes out half of San Francisco. Well, all right, so it destroys Levi's factory and headquarters. Well, now what do you do? Well, most people focus inward and either shut down operations till they can rebuild or they go somewhere else. And Levi didn't do that. They kept their workers, even though they didn't have a job for them making jeans, they kept them and had them rebuild the factory and the uh, 
and the headquarters. And Levi extended credit to people so that they could buy his products. He extended lines of credit to any of his customers and they didn't have to repay that for a number of years. Well, kept himself in business, but what else did he do? You think people remember that? I mean, he built equity within the community, within you know, his workforce that was unbelievable. So anyway, part of it is, is making sure you're not overextended that you can weather the storm because you know it's gonna peak and valley. Same thing with your own personal savings accounts, okay? The second piece is, is you're absolutely right, Anthony. Part of it is, you know, making sure you've got research and development. Now remember, research and development costs money. Right. Okay. And so you got to be careful with any product that you bring to the market. So again, that global business plan, making sure that those innovations that you've arrived at or you've acquired or you've set up are best positioned to bring value to your customer and can survive. And that means taking a hard look and doing those hard analysis exercises, those pro forma income statements and return on investment. It's not easy. It may not be 100% accurate, but you got to do it. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Any questions on Unilever? Nah, I don't have any. Okay. All right. So paper on Sunday, no later than 2359. So you got the two questions, we covered that. What's, uh, what's your weekly scenario this week? Oh, I forgot. Somebody, I think somebody? You mentioned it, yeah, there I am. Is it Levi? No, no. it's, it's uh, probably it's a, uh, uh, local uh, motors and uh, industry yeah. study oh, yeah. distillery. So you got two organizations here. Yeah, local motors. Yeah. All right. Now this is out of chapter ten, right? Right. What's chapter ten title? The future impact of innovation on consumers, business, and government. All right. So there may be something that you read in this chapter that relates to these two organizations. So, all right. Good luck. Anyway. Uh, and then, yeah, on Sunday you have your paper. So uh, a little extra work this week, but you guys have already been working on your paper. Okay. Introduction to the study. Okay. Uh, definition of innovation. Where I want to see that definition come from. Probably from the text, right? Yes, the text. Okay. And then uh, some explanations, right? No. Okay, 1,000 to 1,250 words. You know I don't grade on word use. If you can answer all of this in 500 words or less, go for it. I don't think you can, but if you can, and brevity is the soul of wit, I love it. It takes you uh, 12,500 words to answer all these questions, and you don't give me all work, no play, makes Lance a dull boy like out of the movie The Shining. In other words, you're not filling it with fluff, you're actually articulating uh, spots, then go for it, okay? But 1, 1,250 words isn't a lot, which should give you an example, an idea that don't be spending a lot of time on building me a watch, okay? Um, one of the reasons why I had you identify the company to me is because I'm gonna, I've already taken a look at it. And I've already looked at a couple of current articles on where they're at right now. All right. So in the introduction of your study, uh, don't be spending three pages telling me the history of Tesla. Okay. Understood. Just enough to be effective and then get in and get out. Good. All right. And you all have the rubric that I'm going to use, right? Right. Yes. All right. Okay. And then your final paper 
is the personal innovation. That's due the following Sunday, the 20th. Mm -hmm. right. And that is more personal in nature. Okay. In the introduction, you're going to uh, identify what that innovation is that you want to make personally or help your organization make. And then assessment of your strengths and weaknesses relative to innovation. Okay. And then risk taking, creativity, flexibility, define any of the problems. You've already read about problems, barriers to change, right? Mm -hmm. And describe any um, concepts from the text that'll help you improve the process, right? And then your personal innovation plan. What is your plan? Right? Okay. Again, 1,000 to 1,250 words, APA formatting, uh, double space, one inch margins, 12 point font, right? right? Okay. And you should have the rubric for that. Yes. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at chapter 10 real fast. Okay, for the consumer, innovation makes daily life easier and allows for competition in the marketplace, resulting in more options. Is that true? Daily increase. Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, although technology does raise some concerns and potential privacy violations, the benefits to the consumer are proving to outweigh the negatives. Hmm, interesting point. What was the innovation he was talking about? Oh, uh, um, what's it called? Face, where they talk to each other. What's it? YouTube, not YouTube, but what's his name? Um, Facebook. Okay, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg, right? Right. Okay. Did you uh, did you have a study on him? Yes. Chapter one, right? Yep. Okay. So, are the benefits to consumers outweighing the negatives? Uh, it, 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 it all depends. I think. I think it all depends on um, who you talk to and who who whose information gets possibly. Stolen and the effect that it has on them. Okay, good point. So you're going to look at the financial and non-financial performance measures, right? Right. Because if consumers don't get value out of it, are they going to continue to use it? No. Okay, good point. All right. Okay. So you got a lot of examples out there. Gravity light, pretty cool. Using gravity to produce light in areas that uh, don't have normal electricity. Okay, different types of phones. Um, all right. Um, this one's a little freaky. Pillow talk. It's now called a company called Little Riot. Uh. All right, where you can uh, you have a wristband that picks up and sends your heartbeat in real time to your loved one. <laughs> of course, you know, that could cause an issue. Yeah. Hey, it's three o'clock in the morning there. How come I don't hear your wrist beat, your uh, heartbeat? Where were you? Uh, How come you were getting in from the bar so late? Anyway, I'm sure that won't cause any problems. Yeah. All right. So there's some new terms to know in some of this. Okay. They bring out crowdsourcing. What is crowdsourcing? or pay it for your own research and development to a degree, right? right? So you're going out. So all these, a lot of these things that you are participating in um, to include GoFundMe and other things is a means of crowdsourcing. In other words, to gauge uh, or get contributions outside of the norm. 
to see how much interest there is. If I could show that I've got a heavy amount of interest and my product on, for example, GoFundMe or whatever, you know, Shark Tank or whatever, <clears throat> that may make it a little easier for me to go to an established capital fund uh, or bank and get the monies that I need to bring it through. Okay. So to say crowdsourcing is a portmanteau. Okay. What is a portmanteau? Uh, in this case, portmanteau is a blend of words. Yes. So for example, the blend of smoke and fog is smog. Mm. Blend of mo motor <laughs> and hotel, meaning a hotel that you drive to is a motel. motel. Wow. So crowdsourcing, it's a blend of words. Wow. Meaning getting the ideas from the crowd. Well done. Good job. Okay, so we get into business intelligence and how you uh, go about mining through data um, and are able to drive effective customer um, drive to loyalty, if you will, okay? Mm. And so uh, they talk about in your text, page 177, right? Okay. Okay. And so from time to time, take a look at these names, take a look at some of these companies and update it because uh, you'll find some very interesting elements to it and some different, uh, some different aspects, okay? But Paul Covey, the chairman of SITA, CETA, which is a uh, telecommunications provider for the airline industry, noted how important leveraging social network information is in the airline industry. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And you saw that with Ryanair. Mm. Okay. So then they give you a, uh, I think they give you a chart, right? that shows some elements of um, innovative companies. Uh, page 185, table 10.2. Forbes 2012, 100 most innovative companies and Fortune's 100 best companies to work for, right? Right. If you all take a look and maybe update that. You don't need to because your trusty instructor already did it for you. So if you look at my slide, you'll see not only do I give you 2015 data, I also give you the most recent, which is 2018. And so the number one innovative company was Salesforce. And in 2015, they were number two, and 2018, number three. Where do you suppose Google fell out? Yeah, well, I mean, since then. I've never heard of Salesforce. I'm saying they still in the top ten. Google didn't even get in the hundred. Whoa. That's why you see those dashes there. Mm. Don't even make it. Wow. Okay. NetApp, Qualcomm. Microsoft, don't even make it to the 100, okay? Um, yeah, okay, so Google, number one, best place to work in 2012. 2015, they were number one. Where do you suppose they were for 2018? Well, I don't know the whole data, so good question, all right? So let's take a look at some of the scenario studies you had. Um, Facebook showed up as number 10 on the most innovative in 2011. And then... L'Oreal 94? L'Oreal 94, Unilever number 70. Mm. Otherwise, nobody shows up. So interesting that you had studies on companies that don't even show up. Now, why is some of these, what we would think of innovative companies, not on these lists? 
their bell curve of innovation happened in 2015. And now their older style innovation and other companies are surpassing them because they're up to like the newest modern stuff. That's a good point. Anthony, you got a guess? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say sort of like you were saying is that, I mean, times have changed and um, some some folks uh, went on with the, with the times that they could see things that were happening and then some companies just stayed, um, got comfortable to where they were. And I think uh, most importantly, I think education. You know, um, a lot of people are educated so much now on the internet and whatever they want to do, they can research their own stuff and figure out a way, vice, and then they can really compare, you know, certain organizations because the information is right there. Good. Now, let me ask you something. Yeah. All right. Let me tell you something. How do you, how do you get reviewed by Forbes or by Fortune for these lists? You have to submit. You have to submit your package. Right. You have to pay to submit the application for them to consider you. Mm. So why do you suppose a couple companies don't show up on these lists? Because they ain't going to pay them. <laughs> okay, so be careful on some of these right. lists. All right. Um, okay, so open innovation comes out in this particular chapter. All right. Uh, what is called the co-creation spectrum. Make sure you look at three crucial factors of that, okay? And this is co-creation spectrum is talking about taking an idea through development and then getting feedback on that product. So you then have improvements to a newly, in, uh, newly produced innovation, okay? All right, co-creation spectrum. I'm coming up with a new product. I've got Lucky Charms with new blue diamond marshmallows, okay? And I introduce that, and you, Anthony, say, hey, that's pretty cool that you got new marshmallows, but I want pink unicorns as well. Okay, mm -hmm. so I approve. All right, Brick, we talked about it. Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Okay, make sure you look at this slide before we run out of time, less than a minute. The process is essential. And I wanna make sure that you all take a look at these seven ideas here. And I've given you slide numbers and or pages to help you out on that, okay? Okay. All right, next week, I'm gonna have you read uh, an article and I'm gonna send it to you since you don't have a chapter to read. Fair uh, enough? Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, parting shot. 